Hey everyone, welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code, Peaks, Code Pink's weekly webinar. My name is Leonardo Flores. I'm super pleased to have with us today independent journalist Alina Duarte from Mexico. And so just a technical uh, issue real quick. We recorded this earlier and for some reason it, the audio, only the audio came through. So after this first question, you're only going to see photographs of us and you're going to hear the audio. Uh, Alina was very kind in, uh, to uh, we record the introduction and the first question so that you can see the, the dynamic a little bit. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Alina. I hope you'll follow her on Instagram and Twitter because she's been doing an amazing job of covering the George Floyd uprising here in DC. Uh, and so this is the, we just passed the two year anniversary of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's election in Mexico. And he's been in office now for a year and a half. And he came into office, of, you know, he's talking about the, a for, the fourth transformation, which you, we'll talk about later on, but I wanted to have your assessment of, of what you, how you think he's done in the first year in, in his first year and a half in office. Uh, well, thanks for having me, uh, Leo. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure for me uh, participating with you here in the in this uh, webinar and everywhere. So, yeah, uh, two years ago, with a uh, real like a uh, high percent of the population voted for Andres Manuel López Obrador, more than sixty percent uh, was the result of that day, the July the second of two thousand eighteen. He has a lot of support between, like, even so far after a year and a half, uh, he has more more than 70% that it's still a lot of uh, support uh, compared to other governments or in the rest of the world. I mean, after a year and a half, we can say so, like 70%, it's a lot. Even when he has gone through a lot of uh, incidents, to call it like that, uh, including this uh, pandemic. So after a year and a half, I think during this fourth, uh, this so-called uh, fourth transformation, the first, I'm gonna say later also, uh, is the, uh, the, the, revolu the independence of Mexico, second the revolution, and the third one, this uh, during the 19th century, uh, called these uh, reforms, liberal reforms, uh, against the, like, the relationship between the state and the church and a lot of uh, issues. Uh, now this is, uh, he calls the, the, for the fourth transformation, La Cuarta Transformación, La Cuatro T in Spanish. And uh, he's always uh, trying to change this narrative uh, of what we had for the last 80 years in Mexico, 70 years of the PRI and 12 years actually of the uh, PAN and, uh, and also a new, a new, uh, new term of the PRI. So after that, uh, all of uh, these uh, decades, he's trying to change uh, first the narrative because we are gonna get into this debate if he's a leftist or no <laughs> a, a, a governor. So uh, the, the, there have been, that's right, like a lot of changes, including for example, the educa in education. He approved this education reform, but there are a lot of criticizers saying that, uh, like critics, saying that this was mostly the same reform that the past governments tried to improve in Mexico. So that's not like a real progressive uh, reform on education, but there has been uh, a lot of investment of the uh, education system now in Mexico. Also the healthcare, and there is something that it's so, um, uh, the, on the debate in Mexico, because AMLO months ago say that the pandemic was the best that could have happened for the Mexican government. So that was real, like a polemic. It was really <laughs> a mess, absolutely. <laughs> so he tried to explain what was he referring to. And he was saying that one of the purposes of, or the objectives of the Mexican government was to improve the, the public health care system in Mexico. So so that's why he decided to improve now in this context of, uh, of this uh, pandemic. He invested and the government invested a lot in hospitals that were dismantled during the last administrations. A lot of uh, yeah, invested in, in doctors, in nurses, in a lot of uh, things. For example, this relationship uh, between China and Mexico. Now it's stronger because of the COVID. Uh, there have been like 20 flights with it, it, things for, for fight COVID in Mexico. 
that are coming from China. Also, even with the U.S., a lot of the ventilators uh, are coming from the U.S., well, are going to, to Mexico from the U.S. And now we have a stronger healthcare system uh, to, uh, to fight the COVID specifically in, in Mexico. So that's a, another, another change uh, that has been going on in, in Mexico, the, 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 the issue of the healthcare. And I think that there is a lot of, uh, it's, it's something really controversial in terms of, for example, these projects, the so-called uh, Majan train, that it's not even Majan. And is this narrative against that we heard a lot during the last government, so during this neoliberal uh, uh, time in Mexico that it's about the uh, progress uh, of the development of the communities and it is not. Actually the indigenous communities have been fighting against this project so it's complicated to say that this is a, this is a progressive uh, uh, politic of uh, um, AMLO's uh, government. Uh, also, I think um, we need to, it's complicated the relationship with the social movements now in Mexico. They are trying to fight for a more progressive agenda that AMLO is not necessarily open to listen, even to just to listen, like the feminist movement. Uh, even when we have seen, uh, not only here, because it's complicated, like the March of Women as an example, because here in the U.S., I think that not necessarily are like real revolutionary women's fighting against patriarchy and, uh, you know, it's more like a liberal agenda. Uh, in Mexico, I think it's pretty different. Uh, or in, in, like after the war on drugs, uh, I think one of the most affected groups in Mexico have been the women. So there have been a lot of social movements during the last 14 years trying to improve uh, this strategy against the, the war on drugs. And mostly all of them are women. So this feminist movement, it's not only about young people, it's it, like talking about patriarchy. It's also about these uh, women, mothers who, who have lost their children during this war. So AMLO has not listened as we have been like hoping uh, also he has saying that this feminist movement is conservative when we know that we that yeah there there's always this opposition who has been trying to um, uh, fight uh, against the women's rights and now they are calling themselves feminists but this is not the like the reality of the feminist movement in Mexico, and I'm look, is, is saying all the time that it's a conservative movement. Um, but also, there are so many feminists in the government, so it's it's unfair to say that he's not listening all the, the feminist movement the government is doing. Uh, he, but he's not <laughs> definitely, and so it's a pretty complicated situation after uh, years, uh, one year and a, and a half, and after two years of the elections. But I uh, uh, also we're going to talk about it later. Uh, this foreign policy towards Latin America it has changed a lot. It has been really progressive compared to what we had in the other administrations. Um, the relationship between the U.S. it's pretty complicated. They have been uh, defying. For example, Amlo has has defied uh, defeat. Confrontar, confront like the, the government of uh, Trump in issues like with Venezuela or uh, yeah with the exile of Evo Morales but at the end he has been really uh, submissive to the migration politics so you know it's it's a it's not it's unfair to say that he's not progressive and i think the most important part of this year and a half are the programs the social programs that he have been improved in all of the country in mexico we are 120 million of people and so may it's approximately like 60 million of people lives under poverty and uh, from that part of the population, around 80, 90 percent now, uh, according to AMLO, AMLO's administration, 
has now access to a social program. That means that if you are indigenous, you have a, an access to a certain program. If you have a disability and you live in, I don't know, in the, in the south of Mexico that are one of the poorest parts of, of the country, you have access to another program. If you are poor and you have kids, so there are so many programs that have been implemented during the last um, year and a half. And actually that's why I'm always saying that he has been fighting uh, successfully the, the COVID because now with this uh, wealth redistribution, we are fighting uh, like uh, better than we could have done with another government. So I think that's the most important part of, of this uh, year and a half, uh, these social programs implemented. I mean, we're talking about 60 million of people. So it's, it's amazing, uh, even not only the 60 million, but for example, there are, uh, for example, my grandma receives a, a program just because she is more than 60 years and all of the population, even if you are rich, you are poor, you have access to this uh, program. Uh, uh, once a month, I guess, so a doctor goes to my place and check her health. Uh, so it's something that didn't happen before. Uh, for example, in I mean, there are, there are so many so many examples, and of course that the reality has changed. But I think that we can do better. When he is saying that he's left this government, we already know that he is not uh, a socialist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist. He's not. He did, he hasn't said so for for ten years that he has been running for something or where he is, he was a major of Mexico City. He has not said so, never, like never, ever. And um, yeah, so now we have a lot of contradictions in the government, even when they have implemented these kind of programs. Uh, we have seen like part of the, the people who he used to call the mafia in power. Now we see that they are part of the government with the oligarchs, the businessmen. They are really close to him after he was calling him, calling them uh, the mafia in power. So let's, uh, we are seeing with this pandemic that the contradictions are getting like more profound. And we will see if he radicalizes uh, his, uh, his administration. And I think something's gonna happen because you cannot say that you agree with the working class and with the businessmen at the same time. So it's about time that we can see something like we saw uh, in Honduras, for example, in 2009, or what we saw months ago, eight months ago in Bolivia with the coup against Evo Morales. Actually, uh, we, are, we now know that it was about lithium and natural sources. Now in Mexico, in the north of Mexico, they discovered not so long ago, like a year ago, that we also have lithium. Uh, so we're gonna see, I guess, some kind of destabilization of the country. We have seen uh, when the murder of these uh, binational people in the border of Mexico and the US, uh, they, uh, Trump take a, took advantage of that, saying that the, this was part of the war on drugs and the narcos were, uh, we should call them uh, uh, terrorist organizations. So that was just the first call to like, hey, something's going on here in their relationship. But yeah, it's, it's all about time. And, but yeah, it has been a long, long, long year and a half of this uh, administration. Yeah, so that's really interesting because he so he ran on a platform of uh, against neoliberalism and it seems like he is investing uh, making a lot of social investments but as you said he is you know very far from a socialist and he also has lots of alliances with uh, business interests and you know oligarchs in mexico and yet there is a very kind of uh, rabid or virulent opposition to amlo uh, from these entrenched elite interests uh, AMLO has something, you know, at one point his popularity was something like 86%, right? And now it might be a little lower, but still well above 50%. And and still, then yet there's these kind of plots against him. And so about a month ago, there was a, a something called the BOA, the Broad Opposition Block, a, a document was leaked, uh, showing them, you know, basically laying out the steps for a soft coup in Mexico. Can you give us some details about that? 
Yeah, well, this uh, opposition has been the same opposition, or I mean, the, the same group that has always uh, been in power for the last 80 years, and now they are really pissed that they lost the elections two years ago. And it's not something that we need to, like, it's something hide. It is not. Absolutely, we know who are these people are. Uh, former presidents like Felipe Calderon, who implemented war on drugs, uh, quotes and quotes, because it's only a civil war that people don't really know what's going on in Mexico and it's something that it's still going on and something that even the opposition is using against Sandlon when they started this war and now there are more than 200 people killed, disappeared, you know, it's complete a, a mess. So that's why people voted for AMLO even when they they knew that he's not a socialist, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist or whatever. And a lot of people I, I know, they just voted for him because he was not the pre, not the pan, and he didn't want to continue uh, this war. So in this um, document that was lead, uh, called, leaked, uh, called uh, Let's Rescue Mexico uh, of this uh, uh, opposition group, uh, its members are, uh, as I said, like former presidents, um, even actors, po politicians, uh, you know, these influencers. Is it okay to say it in English? Influencers? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's in English, actually. <laughs> uh, so uh, they have been doing this war against AMLO and to everything that sounds pretty like to the left. And this is not something new, I must insist. Uh, these are, are the same uh, people who implemented the war on drugs, who are calling now for a public healthcare system when they try to privatize it, for a public education when they try to privatize it. So it's, uh, those are, this, this person, uh, these people are the ones who are trying to implement this strategy. And I must say that this is not the first time during this last year and a half that we see, or at least I've been trying to say that it's it's about time to see uh, open strategy and open uh, attack between the like uh, an alliance between the State Department, the, you know, like the same things that we have seen in Latin America in 2009 in Honduras, now in Bolivia last year, or in many many other in Venezuela, like for the last 20 years. <laughs> I think it's it's only about time to see something like openly a war, an open war against uh, Andres Manuel. Well, we've seen also this uh, massacre in the border of Mexico and the U.S. They were uh, both US, U.S. and Mexican citizens that were killed. And I think that uh, that was like the first, uh, one of the first things that were trying to uh, uh, make some noise against AMLO and to put these narratives against him. And you remember that here Donald Trump tried to uh, call the the narco groups uh, organiza uh, terrorist organizations. And that's why because of this attack, you know, and this is not a, a new narrative. Actually, when Hillary Clinton was uh, at the State Department, she started with these narratives and they tried to make this alliance because uh, between this general that was killed in, in Soleimani, between Soleimani and the ter and the narco traffic uh, in in Mexico, so you know it's 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 it's. Called, it's we need to say that it's not the first time that we see something like like this, and um, yeah, they've been they've been also using this corporate media, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, to uh, implement these narratives that I, I think it's out of context totally. That even when we can say openly, I consider myself a militant journalist, a leftist journalist, and I can say that I'm lo like openly, I can say that he's not a leftist president as we would have a, a president like him to in 2006 but because of the fraud uh, in 2006 we didn't have this AMLO who had like this leftist idea more progressive and things like that now we don't have it we we see these oligarchs in the cabinet um, pretty close to him one of him who is a total oligarch in Mexico Alfonso Romo he's part of the presidential cabinet and he's coming to the White House to this meeting uh, now in, in here in DC so it's like a, it's 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 a strategy of, of course of the far right that 
And we must remember that even this far right from the PAN, the party in Mexico, they are really close to the Venezuelan opposition, the Cuban opposition, the Nicaraguan opposition. So it's not, a, I mean, it's not a surprise that they try to, to do. Actually, there was an audio leaked also more than a month ago between many of them not specifically this group, but specifically uh, between the richest persons in, in Mexico, saying that maybe it was time to call for a aid, a help of the U.S. government. You know, it's like even when they have uh, had a lot of opportunities in Mexico, because there are so many alliances between, for example, Carlos Slim or uh, Ricardo Salinas Pliego, who is the owner of TV Azteca, the, one of the two principal media outlets in Mexico, and he's owner of almost everything in Mexico. But uh, he have had a lot of opportunities in Mexico, but they are not, they don't have enough, you know, like this, they, they want everything that they used to have like in other governments so yeah it's it's a constant it's not a new war against AMLO but we must say that something that AMLO was saying before that they used to call, he used to call them the mafia in power and now part of this mafia is in the government you no know? so it's part of the contradictions yeah I mean one of the things that really struck me about this uh this plan the let's Res rescue Mexico plan was how they really want to control the narrative in the media. And of course, in, in Mexico, they own all of the media and they have alliances with the media here in the US. And so two days ago, three days ago on July 5th, Enrique Krause had an, an op-ed in the New York Times. I'm not sure if you were able to see it, but basically he, he compares AMLO to Trump, which is, you know, totally ridiculous. And, and it's part of a kind of this strategy, right? To, to, to discredit AMLO, especially in the United States. And so, and to, you know, start building support uh, for, if not for a, a hard coup, then a soft coup, which is very much what they plan. They, they, they want to take over uh, the, the legislature and then basically do the equivalent of impeaching AMLO. Uh, but one of the other things that Krause does is he, he harshly criticizes AMLO for coming to visit Trump, which is, to me, you know, I think he'd be criticized either way. If he, if he said no to visiting Trump, then these <laughs> yeah. same actors would, would be like up with her, you know, you, you know, would be rioting almost saying, how can you not visit, you know, the president of the most po uh, powerful country in the world? But so Almo has arrived, uh, you know, on Tuesday night to the U.S. to visit Trump. Can you talk a little bit about what, uh, what's going to be on the, the agenda for this visit? Yeah, well, its agenda is this uh, memorial, visiting the memorial of Abraham Lincoln, what I consider a total mis mistake. I personally, it's like, what are you, why are you doing this? Uh, specifically here in the, in, in the capital, when we saw in the Lincoln Park here in Washington, D.C., that people uh, are, are trying to uh, throw down down this statue of Lincoln uh, when they are like doing this uh, education on anti-blackness and Lincoln uh, was part of that. So I think that's a wrong message. Uh, I know that he admires, Amlo admires a lot of the, uh, Lincoln and things like that, but well, that's his decision. Also, he visits uh, the statue of Benito Juarez, an indigenous president of Mexico. And then he he's having uh, this time uh, a meeting with Donald Trump, a private meeting that it's gonna last only half an hour. And then the bilateral commissions are gonna meet everyone and a uh, part of what we were saying before is that the these uh, people the owners of the media outlets the owners of everything in mexico are gonna have a dinner with donald trump and with amlo in the white house it's it's a strong message i know and as you said the narratives against the visit are really strong and i must say that actually i don't it's not that I'm a conservative, but at the same time, it's like AMLO, I don't know if he's considering that this was necessary, especially when uh, Justin Trudeau uh, didn't want to come to, to, to DC to um, be part of this meeting towards the, the new NAFTA. And um, I think it's, it's, it's not only about the meeting with Donald Trump. I, I don't know if you saw that even the Democrats, the Hispanic caucus uh, with Alexandria Ocasio, Jesus Castro, uh, Jose Castro? 
uh, he said, Joaquin, Joaquin Castro, uh, they were saying uh, that uh, this was like a political, uh, the, the, relation, the bilateral relationships uh, were getting like politicized. And I mean, it's, I totally agree, you know, and we must talk actually about uh, <laughs> why AMLO is so interested in coming uh, during, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, in the middle of uh, an uprising here in the U.S. with more than 30,000 cases now, uh, 30,000 people who have died of COVID in Mexico. I mean, it's not like the best moment to come to the U.S. and specifically, uh, it's the first trip uh, abroad of Mexico of uh, AMLO, he didn't want. He said uh, since the beginning of his uh, presidency that he didn't want to travel. That his best foreign policy uh, will be the domestic policy. So this is his first uh, first trip in in a year and a half. So it's interesting because we I remember that the pan uh, in Mexico were really was really really close to Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016 and they were calling to vote for Hillary and I don't know if AMLO is trying to yeah to convince Mexicans and it's pretty complicated what I'm gonna say because <laughs> I don't know if he's trying to convince them to vote for uh, Trump because the pan and the far right would have a better alliance with the Democrats uh, even when Trump has called those rapists murderers or gangster bad hombres and whatever he wants to so I don't know we we're gonna see what's happened what, what they're gonna say in this uh, press conference that I hope they they have uh, but AMLO since uh, his um, press conference yesterday he was saying that he's not trying to confront anyone that he wants to have uh, this uh, good neighbor policy uh, but let's see because we know who is Donald Trump that he is not only the president but the candidate of the Republicans so it's it's complicated what, what like the message or to find something good uh, or at least uh, like the less bad <laughs> of these visits, but let's see how it goes. And in the, the days prior to the visit, Trump was tweeting pictures of the wall uh, on the border, which seems kind of like a, either some sort of provocation or message, but can you tell us a little bit about, just tell us the story about uh, Trump and the wall and AMLO? Yeah, actually uh, we have had a, like a lot of, uh, uh, like uh, episodes of the wall. Do you remember that uh, Trump was saying all the time that Mexico was going to pay for the wall? The Mexican government didn't want to confront it during the last year, but at the same time, he put a lot of the Mexican National Guard in, in the south border of Mexico, so we became the wall. <laughs> like, but, you know, it's like we didn't pay for it, we became the wall. We are the wall. And now he visits, uh, Trump visited Arizona and he posted these pictures of the wall uh, two days uh, before AMLO, AMLO arrived to, to Washington. Also, uh, I, I was listening that Trump is going to try to push once again uh, this idea or this um, initiative of uh, like uh, to end DACA. So 80% of the, of the dreamers, of the DACA recipients in the U.S. are Mexicans. So that's a really strong message. That's something, of course, that they have to talk. And of course, that we know Donald Trump and he's going to say something or the press are going to ask something about it. And actually in Mexico City, uh, the press asked uh, AMLO uh, what was his opinion on, on the wall. And he said, like, I don't want to talk about it. I, I want to get to the line. I'm, I'm going to be silent about it. Let's wait. I don't want to be confronted and whatever. So we know that AMLO, it's not as Donald Trump trying to, to fight all the time. But it's true that, that AMLO, it's, par, it's complicit of these immigration policies with the U.S. And even when he is saying, he said before this trip that he wanted to uh, like to 
to defend the the migrants' uh, rights, but at the same time, we have seen <laughs> that that's not true in Mexico. That there is a lot of racism, xenophobia, and uh, the national guard in the south border of Mexico. Uh, it's not like the best way to treat migrants. And even AMLO haven't uh, hasn't visited, for example, these uh, detention centers in Mexico that we have, and that a lot of human rights organizations have been calling him out to say something, to visit him, to even the, the same uh, Congress people in, in Mexico are trying to push this idea that if, if they are leftists, they should have a better migration policy. So yeah, it's, it's very complicated. And specifically, I think it's one of the, or the hardest uh, issue uh, during this meeting, like the, the, the issue on, on migration. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, how Mexico is handling the COVID pandemic? Well, as I was saying before, like uh, Hamlo was really, <laughs> it was shocking to hear this affirmation. He was saying that is the best that could happen for it, that, uh, what he calls the, the, the Fourth transformation? Is it okay in English? Like the fourth transformation? Yeah. yeah, well, the first, yeah, it's like the new process. That's how he calls these, uh, his government and this new process, social process in, in Mexico. That it means that we had the independence as the first transformation, the revolution, and then uh, this process of new uh, laws during the 19th. Uh, 19th century. Uh, so now this is like the fourth big transformation. And uh, he was saying that this was the best uh, thing that could happen for uh, his uh, desires to uh, have a better, uh, better healthcare uh, system in Mexico. So that was really controversial. He had to explain it thousands of times before people got the idea that he was trying to, to like to say to tell everyone um, and they have been investing a lot of money in in hospitals in infrastructure in in ho in doctors nurses they've been contracting people um, to handle the the covid and i mean they what, something that people in Mexico, I think are really grateful for is the issue that they have been really or the most possible transparent or really honest when they say that there are gonna be people dying, people sick, people, we need time to invest in hospitals, to like have everything. There, are, this was last week, uh, there was like the 20th uh, flight from China, something like that, with uh, things for, for COVID. So it's impressive what uh, they have done in just a uh, few months. Uh, well, almost, yeah, it's, it's almost half of a year at this point. <laughs> but um, I think we have had more, as I said, 30,000 people who have died because of COVID in a population of 120 million uh, of people. So that's, I mean, it's, it's sad and it's, but I, I, it could have been worse, definitely. And uh, so now we are at the point in, for example, in Mexico City, where we have more than 23 million of people in the, like in the metropolitan, uh, metropolitan area. And now the cases are going down. And for this week was, I think, the first week that we, we've seen uh, this situation. But there are still growing like a lot of cases. And it has to, to be because um, we have more than 50% of our economy. It's informal. It's not, uh, they don't have access to unemployment or something like that. People had to work during the pandemic. Uh, there are like a lot of in even in Mexico City, you know, like there were this principal market in Mexico City where there were thousands of cases of COVID, but they didn't close. They were still working every day. So that was really hard. And, and I think that they could have done specifically because we saw the cases, for example, in Venezuela, that they gave a lot of like, they, they took it more seriously and from a leftist uh, like uh, way to do it, you know, like 
uh, canceling the rents or doing this uh, like canceling the payments of uh, water uh, you know this this kind of things that we didn't see in Mexico but at the same time AMLO was saying like okay this is not gonna be that hard because we have implemented implemented a lot of social programs so that's how we are gonna fight COVID in Mexico and that was absolutely not enough but at the same time, as I said, like it could have been worse, definitely, with another government, but that's not enough to say that it would have been worse. Uh, I think uh, at this point he can do better, absolutely. And definitely it's a big difference. For example, in Mexico City, uh, if you were only suspicious to have COVID, uh, you received a package with food with 1,000 pesos that it's like 200, no, like, three hundred dollars for like a month uh so you can you could stay in home you know so they tried to prevent and then they started to do this test in, in a lot of places so they tried to do it in the in the the best way possible but at the same time as i said I, we need to look at the past and we need to understand that mexico had a complete uh, a destroyed healthcare system and it was really hard to think that we could uh, survive this pandemic like they did i don't know in other countries when they have a, a formal economy when they are a, for example, even for example in Vietnam, that they even having borders with China, they didn't have so many cases because they closed everything. The state it was responsible of uh, giving money and uh, satisfying the necessities of the population. I think Mexico would have done more, but they didn't. And at the same time, they did it uh, the best. Uh, not the best, but better than the, the 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 last governments could have done. So yeah, it's 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 complicated to say that this is the best option. It was not absolutely, but it could have been worse if they didn't invest so much money in in hospitals, in doctors, nurses, uh, in these flights, even uh, these ventilators coming from the U.S. from China. Uh, they accept these brigades from Cuba, the, Medi the Cuban doctors. Uh, so, I mean, it's like uh, we need to be fair with what they've done. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I just saw an article about an hour ago, and this goes back to the issue of how they're building a narrative against AMLO. And the article talked about how it was so shocking that Mexico, the, the deaths from COVID in Mexico had just passed Fran the Fran France's deaths. And they don't mention that Mexico has twice the population, yes, if not yeah. slightly more than France. And so I think there, we have to do, be fair in terms of, uh, you know, analyzing or assessing uh, Mexico's COVID response. And it's certainly, they, I'm certainly done much, much better than say Bolsonaro or Trump or Añez or Benny Moreno in Ecuador, you know. So it, it hasn't been all bad. Uh, and finally, last question, because you, you kind of briefly mentioned it, the issue of Venezuela, whenever Trump meets with the president from Latin America, particularly from Latin America, but anyone from over the world, actually, the issue of Venezuela comes up. Can you talk, tell us uh, just what AMLO's position has been regarding Venezuela? Well, yeah, I think I've been, I have been unfair in this talk now that you say something about Venezuela, because something that I was really pleased as a journalist, as a militant from the left in Mexico is to see a total different uh, foreign policy uh, when it comes to Latin America. Definitely we've seen a change, or at least, for example, in Venezuela, specifically in the case of Venezuela, uh, we saw for more than a year, uh, the last government of the Republic Enrique Peña Nieto attacking every single day Venezuela when we had a human uh, a humanitarian crisis in Mexico because of the war on drugs, because of uh, the murder and disappearance of 43 students of Ayotinapa. And they were so cynical when they came. I remember I was covering here the LAS all the time. And they were like, oh my God, Venezuela, we need to talk about human rights all the time. And I don't remember I asked him in front of like everyone, like how Mexico uh, can say something like that when we have a human crisis in our country who do you think you are and he was like okay no we are uh, we are open to the 
like to the human rights organizations. So that's why like this is different. And I was like, okay, whatever you say. But now we, we see a new policy at the, specifically at the OAS because I think that was the best example of foreign policy towards Venezuela, like in, in Mexico. And now we have an ambassador who openly denounces the case, for example, that we saw in Venezuela when um, like two months ago, uh, this uh, kind this uh, attempt of uh, an intervention a failed intervention <laughs> and one of uh, so many that we have seen <laughs> during the last years but um, she openly condemned it and she was confronting also Almagro saying like why we're not talking about this why it's always about Venezuela why it's always about another countries and when we need to talk about human rights and uh, sovereignty of uh, Venezuela we're not talking about that uh, so it's uh, totally different even when they are not uh, openly supporting specifically under Andres Manuel in his uh, press conferences during the morning that all the people and specifically this corporate media are always asking uh, what's your position about Maduro and what do you think are you allies and we're all the time all the time and he's like okay I'm not gonna say because I respect the the other countries I respect their intern policies so I'm not gonna say anything about that but in the OAS, we see this, uh, like our new ambassador saying these kind of things, or even when he was asked about the possibility of sending oil to um, gasoline to Venezuela, he, when we know that the U.S. is always trying to push these uh, sanctions, bad cold sanctions, these unilateral economic uh, uh, issues, uh, we saw AMLO saying that we are gonna, we have our own sovereignty and we are gonna do whatever we want. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if the US or another country uh, try to do something. We, we respect our, our nations, uh, we are independent, so we can take this, uh, this kind of uh, like um, medidas. Yeah. Measures. Measures, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've seen that. We've seen the exile. Uh, like uh, he, he accepts Evo Morales as, a, uh, as an asylum, uh, you know, like uh, after the coup in Bolivia. We've seen this relationship with the new government of Argentina. We've seen uh, actually the visit of the president of Cuba, uh, Diaz Canel. Uh, we are seeing this new uh, relationship with Russia uh, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting close every, every day. So yeah, it's absolutely different. And in the case of Venezuela, it was a complete change. Even as I said, when he's not openly supporting, he, he's trying, and even with, with food, Mexico has been sending food to Venezuela. And now I think someone was sanctioned in Mexico, I guess, because of this uh, situation. But I mean, it's not that they are close allies, but at the same time, it's not an enemy as we saw during the last administration. Great, thank you so much for your time, Alina. Uh, if you could remind our viewers of your Instagram and Twitter handles, that would be great because I really think they should follow you. Uh, thanks again for being here. No, thank you. Yeah, uh, well, my Twitter is at Alina Duarte, and I don't, I don't know how to say it, uh, guión bajo. <laughs> underscore. Underscore, yeah, at Alina Duarte underscore, and Instagram, it's the opposite. It's at uh, underscore Alina Duarte, and uh, Alina Duarte Periodista, that means a journalist in Facebook. You can find me, you can follow me, and, and I'm trying to, to now covering this uh, uprising here in the U.S. Uh, and during the next weeks, I'm going to be in Bolivia, like in the next month. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the presidential elections after the coup. And I think they are going to be complicated. And of course, maybe we can do another program on Bolivia soon. I hope so. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, Leo. Again. All right, Thank everyone. You. Tune in again next week. Bye. Bye-bye.